Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Reversul îmbătrânirii. Iată aceasta este tema celui de al doilea episod special în care vom continua interviul cu unul dintre cei mai importanți oameni de știință din lume care s-au ocupat de această tematică. Este vorba de profesorul Michael Fossel care a descoperit mecanismele îmbătrânirii, a pus bazele unei terapii anti-îmbătrânire, a elaborat teorii novatoare privind vindecarea tuturor maladiilor produse de îmbătrânire și momentan e singurul care a acceptat un interviu prin camera web pentru emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Citeam cu imire pe pagina Facebook a comunității Aging Reverse, reversul îmbătrânirii, titlurile unor materiale semnate de cercetători, ale căror cercetări au fost în permanență validate și acceptate. Iată câteva exemple. Ray Kurzweil, inventator și viitorolog, prevede longevitate prelungită până înainte de 2030 sau că noi ar trebui să avem, de fapt, viață veșnică, spune domnia sa. Gerontologul Aubrey de Grey și-a dedicat munca combaterii îmbătrânirii. Aflăm despre terapiile genetice și multe alte asemenea titluri șocante comparate pe o pagină de Facebook înființată în toamna anului 2015. Reversul îmbătrânirii ar putea fi cel mai uimitor subiect prezentat în ultimii șase ani la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. De remarcat faptul că în ultimii patru ani, în perioada 30 noiembrie 2011-30 noiembrie 2015, Audiența acumulată pe arhiva tuturor episoadelor postate pe pagina de YouTube a înregistrat până acum și peste 7 milioane de minute vizionate, adică echivalentul la peste 14 ani. Ceea ce nu e nimic neobișnuit dacă n-ar fi vorba de o emisiune de știință care, în general, are o audiență mult mai scăzută decât o emisiune cu subiect politic sau despre istoria României, folclor, muzică ușoară sau filme artistice. Revenind la interviul realizat prin conexiune internet cu profesorul Michael Fossel, aș dori să mai precizez câteva date importante despre domnia sa. Michael Fossel a publicat articole despre îmbătrânire și etică pentru revista Asociației Americane Medicale și în revista numită In Vivo. Prima sa carte intitulată Inversarea îmbătrânirii umane a fost publicată în anul 1996. Cartea a atras critici favorabile în presa scrisă, precum și din partea celor de la Scientific American, fiind ulterior reeditată în șase limbi. Un manual academic enciclopedic numit Celulele îmbătrânirea și maladiile umane a fost publicat în anul 2004 la Oxford University Press, semnat de Michael Fossel. Încă din primele zile în calitate de profesor la Universitatea Stanford, Michael Fossel a început să studieze îmbătrânirea dintr-o perspectivă medicală și științifică, punând accentul în special pe sindroame premature de îmbătrânire, cum ar fi progeria. Începând cu anul 1996, a fost un promotor al terapiei telomerazei ca un potențial tratament al bolilor legate de îmbătrânire, a tulburărilor și sindromelor, cum ar fi progeria, boala Alzheimer, ateroscleroza, osteoporoza, cancerul și alte afecțiuni. Michael Fossel a descris cu mare atenție terapia telomerazei ca fiind un potențial tratament pentru aceste afecțiuni și nu un leac pentru limită de vârstă. Terapia telomerazei ar putea fi un panaceu pentru afecțiuni medicale legate de îmbătrânire, care totodată ar putea extinde radical speranța maximă de viață și de a reversa procesul de îmbătrânire la cei mai mulți dintre noi. Mai exact, Fossel prevede potențialul terapiei telomerazei ca fiind punctul cel mai eficace și unic de intervenție într-o varietate de afecțiuni medicale legate de îmbătrânire. Noua sa carte, Revoluția Telomerazei, datată 2015, oferă o explicație atentă a procesului de îmbătrânire, bolile legate de îmbătrânire, precum și perspectivele de intervenție, inclusiv studiile umane viitoare. Ceea ce veți vedea peste câteva momente ar putea fi șocant și tulburător. Dear Professor Michael Fossel, welcome to our Science and Knowledge TV program for part two of our interview for the first time in Romania on TVR Cluj. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mulțumesc. Last time we discussed very important issues about main theories and myths regarding aging. And I heard a lot about genes, which had been spread in the media since decades. And this time to correct those myths and errors. I hear, for example, this is a dangerous gene, or that gene is causing cancer. But very few biologists spoken publicly showing, no, that, that's not true. Gene is correlated with the disease 
another cause of it. Please tell us about changing the gene expression as a result of telomere shortening. Well, before I do that, let me give you a humorous example of this, about the problem of causation versus correlation. Um, it, we know that genes can correlate with disease without actually causing it. And here's, here's a, a, a humorous example. Let's say I go to the grocery store, and every time anybody comes out of the store, I record everything that they buy. And I mark it all down carefully what they bought, and then I watch them for the next 10 years to see what diseases they get. I would find a very good correlation it would show that people who buy infant diapers don't get heart disease. Why? Because they tend to be 20 years old, they've got a new baby, they're young, therefore they don't get heart disease. But the correlation would suggest that buying diapers present, prevents heart disease. Not at all true. It's no more than a correlation. It's not causation at all. Now, when we look at genes, sometimes there's a strong correlation, and it's even causation. The one ex extreme, sickle cell, sickle cell anemia causes sickle cell anemia, the, the one single gene. On the other hand, we look at things like heart disease, and there are a number of correlations, and Alzheimer's, a number of correlations, APOE4, for example. But what we find is that some people have APOE4, two alleles of it, double hit, they don't seem to get Alzheimer's. Other people get Alzheimer's, they don't seem to have APOE4 genes. And yet, there's a correlation. But that correlation is just a correlation. There's some link there, but it's not as simple as APOE4 causes Alzheimer's. Here's another example like that. We know that um, if I look at heart disease, there are four major risk factors that most people can identify. They think of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, high uh, glucose, and smoking. All those are risk factors. And yet, if I look at progeric children, these are children who at age five look like they're 80 years old. They have enormous high risk for heart disease. Most of them die of heart disease and strokes. Those children never have those four risk factors. They don't have elevated cholesterol. They don't have elevated blood, blood glucose or uh, hypertension or the, none of them smoke. And yet they have the disease. Does that mean that the disease model is wrong? No. It means the disease model is incomplete. Our idea of cholesterol causing heart disease isn't so much wrong as it is simplistic. There's more going on than that. And so when we're talking about age-related diseases, it is not true that APOE4 causes Alzheimer's or a single problem with a, a gene and cholesterol metabolism causes heart disease. And yet, they play a role. What we're finding, though, is that it's the pattern of gene expression. It's the, 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 the environment, the biological environment in which those genes are expressed that determines whether the disease occurs or not. So, for example, if I have two APOE4 genes, I'm much more likely to get Alzheimer's as I get older. And if I have two APOE2, my chance of getting it is lower, and sooner or later I may get Alzheimer's, but it'll take longer. And likewise with cholesterol. If I have certain cholesterol abnormalities, I may get heart disease and I die of a heart attack at age 25. But sooner or later, most of us will tend to get those diseases with different genes. It's the environment. It's everything else going on. It's the aging process. It's what you eat. It's your environment with stress. All those play some role. It's not, in most cases, it's not simply a matter of, Gene A causes disease B. It's not that simple. Yes, but for over 20 years, the pharmaceutical companies sold out a lot of statins for the meat of the cholesterol, because we have so many myths regarding the cholesterol. We need to use cholesterol in our body quite a lot. The brain uses it. Sure. Uh, another example would be free radicals. It turns out you need free radicals. We use them to kill bacteria. We use them to alter gene expression patterns. You can't do without free radicals, and yet free radicals could be a risk. Or oxidative damage. Well, I can prevent oxidative damage in your body very simply. All I do is remove all oxygen, and you'd be dead. Oxygen is critical, and yet it can cause problems. So all of these things are, are more complex than just a matter of statins or free radicals. It's a complex environment. The, the body is very complex, very sophisticated, and we need to think about it in sophisticated ways rather than just say cholesterol causes heart disease or statins will cure it. They don't. Yes, but while I was misinformed, I took statins for about two years and I didn't feel better despite the cholesterol was low. But I was going to feel much better after I quit taking statins and the cholesterol is now about 300. 
but having an optimal value of triglycerides, which is in the middle of the interval values. And I'm feeling much better with 300 cholesterol level at almost 52 years old. Well, you look more like 30, I'm sure. Well, of course I'm looking more than 30. You are exaggerating. I'm 52. <laughs> no, but the, you know, the point you raised there is, is a good one. Um, it's not just a matter of, I'm sure there are people who benefit from statins, but not everybody does. And they have risk of their own, they have side effects, they have complications, they have costs. Um, no, the answer to heart disease is not simply to develop four new statins. That's not it. Nor is it a matter of just a better coronary artery bypass graft or heart transplant. That's not the right approach for disease. Again, there are times when that may be your only option. If I have a bad osteoarthritic knee, maybe I need to replace it. But I'd like to do better than that. To me, that's that's old medicine. That's that's 20th century, and this is not the 20th century. It's the 21st. It's time we think in a more sophisticated way and try to cure these diseases rather than just band-aid them. I made the drawing. How I see the evolution of the life sciences from past to future. Yes, I see what you mean. I think you're right. The, you know, there's a tendency for most people to uh, think that things continue in a straight line. And their thinking about how to deal with problems becomes linear. Uh, uh, here's an example. In 1890, there was a big concern in the island of Manhattan, that is in New York City, because of the number of horses and the cost to the city of cleaning up the horse manure on the streets. And the estimate was that by the year 2000, the island of Manhattan would be 40 feet deep in horse manure and we could never keep up. It was a big concern. Now, right now, we're concerned about things like carbon footprint. I have a feeling that if we go forward 100 years, that'll be in the category of horse manure. There will be other concerns because we'll have moved on to different ways of dealing with energy. But the same is true when we look at, at um, problems with biological science. In 1890, there were a group of American and German uh, medical physiologists who were recommending that, that since most cells use simple sugars, they called sugar nature's perfect food and suggested you shouldn't eat anything else. We look back on that and think of that as nonsense, simplistic. But a lot of the thinking we're doing now is just as linear and, and naive in regard to our treatments. Uh, so, example. Uh, in regard to heart disease, again, we start thinking about the next statin or a better surgical procedure rather than taking an inflection, changing the direction and looking at things in a more, uh, in a deeper, more profound sense and asking how things really work and can we do better. Uh, another example of that might be a, a transition that occurred in the last 20 years when we went from thinking of ulcers as simply caused by acid to realizing that there was a bacterial component with helicobacter. Now we realize that there's a way of curing ulcers in a way we never would have imagined before. Or look at the work recently on the microbiome and the idea that this can have a, a, a big impact on obesity and health in general. Instead of it just being a matter of what you eat, it's a matter of the bacteria that you host in your stomach. And again, this is a surprise to people. People didn't see that coming. And I'm not suggesting that, the, that that's the be all and end all of medicine. I'm suggesting that a lot of the changes that come are not simple linear extrapolations. Things change. We developed a whole new insight into the way things work. And this, again, is, is true with regard to aging. The sort of thing that you're talking about here is, I think, what's going on. There's a way of, of approaching these things that is different. For example, you talk about advanced regenerative medicine. That's not something that people really anticipated 20 years ago. And we've really begun to just started to touch the surface of that. Things are going to change and not in expected linear ways, but in the unexpected ways that will have a huge impact on medicine and on our life in general. Do you think that my vision, so to speak, as shown in the drawing, is this the right way to go or we are already going that direction? I think we're going that direction. Now, again, I recognize that just as you and I might agree that that's the direction we're going, we could both be wrong and we may be thinking in a linear way and that something unexpected will again happen. But already the sort of model you're proposing is looking at things in a nonlinear way. You're suggesting that, again, it's not simply a matter of another statin or another surgical procedure. There's more to it than that. Uh, the kind of, of thing you're talking about there is already suggesting what I, th I think we both agree, that the unexpected will occur. 
the, the profound insight, the different concept, the different way of looking at things. That's what's going to make a change in medicine and society. I, I sometimes think that we have not yet gotten to civilization. We may get there. This is just the advent of civilization. We're not civilized, but it may yet come. But if it does, it's not simply going to be one more regulation, one more law, the UN, the WHO. It's going to be a slightly unexpected way of looking at things, I think. Same is true of medicine, same is true of society. Can you describe for our viewers a model to understand how cell aging causes a direct age-related disease? Well, the, the best examples of that would be things like uh, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, or skin aging is a better example, too, because it's so, so easy to see. It, what's happening in my skin, I have, there are two major types of, of, think of them as native cells in my skin. Um, and those skin cells are dividing pretty much all the time. And as they divide, they change their pattern of gene expression. But if I look between those cells and ask what's going on, most of us, as we get older, one of the things we notice is that the skin gets thinner and that it, it's less elastic. So if I pull it up, it doesn't snap back as quickly as it did when I was five years old. Those are all changes that occur because of the way the skin cells are turning over proteins. Um, Here's an analogy I use sometimes. Let's say that I have a, uh, a, a group of cars, and every day the factory sends me 100 cars, and every day I sell 100 cars. And every night somebody comes in and they break one windshield. Okay? But every day I take new 100 cars and I ship out 100 cars, I'm almost never going to have a broken windshield because I just keep turning them over so quickly that you may break a windshield, but it's gone the next day because I keep replacing them. On the other hand, let's say that every night somebody sneaks in and breaks one windshield, but every day I get one car, and every day I get rid of one car. Well, over time, the number of broken windshields are begin to accumulate. That's what's happening with aging. The turnover rate slows down, and even if the rate of breaking windshields is the same, but this is what's going on in my skin. When I'm six years old, every day I'm having damage occurring to these, the proteins, the collagen and the elastin, for example, between my cells. But I'm continuing to turn it over, again, like getting 100 cars and selling 100 cars. So the damage doesn't accumulate. But as I get older, I'm slowing down that rate of turnover of the collagen and elastin. So I begin to accumulate damage. The solution is not for me to go in and put in a moisturizer or inject collagen, because those are static solutions. If I inject new collagen, great, but it's still getting damaged. What I need to do is turn over the collagen. Every day I need to take it out, put in new ones, take it out, put in new ones, rebuild it, break it down, rebuild it, break it down. It's dynamic. What I need to do is turn up the rate of turnover. And that's what we can do if we reset gene expression. So if I'm looking at direct aging, one example is the skin. The cells, as they begin to age, they no longer are repairing and replacing the damage that occurs between the cells and within the cells. And we can change that. Another example would be osteoarthritis. If I look at my knee joint, for example, what I'm looking at is the cells that line that. The cells that age in there are directly responsible for the disease. If I'm looking at osteoporosis, if I'm looking at the aging of the cells within my bones, the rate at which they turn over the, the, the cells and the, uh, the protein matrix and the mineralization of those bones slows with age. So what we find is that as we get older, one approach that's been used for years, for decades, in osteoporosis is to try to increase people's calcium intake. And what we find is that it has essentially no impact on the disease. And the reason isn't that you, in most cases, that you, that you have too little calcium. The reason is you don't have a place to put it. So if I have someone who's a woman who's actually now postmenopausal and she's had six pregnancies, she may be low on calcium. But most people are not low on calcium these days. And if I boost their calcium, the problem is not that they were low on calcium, is that they didn't have the protein to put it anywhere. So it's, it, it, what's happening is as I get older, I'm no longer building as much protein matrix, so I can't put in my calcium and phosphorus. I can't build a good bone. There's no place to put it. And even when I do put it someplace, I'm not turning it over as fast. So if I'm a young person, if I'm six years old and I break my wrist, it may heal in a matter of weeks. But if I'm 65 and I break my wrist, it may take a matter of months. I'm still repairing it. I'm turning over the bone, but much more slowly. So that's... Uh, an example of direct aging, where whether I'm looking at my joints, my bones, my skin, my immune system, it's all a matter of direct aging. The cells that age 
are the cells that are responsible for the disease, for the, the you know, what we see as aging phenomena. So skin cells, skin, skin aging. Joint cells, joint aging. Bone cells, bone, bone aging. Now there's another category of diseases, indirect aging, which we'll come to in a minute. But direct aging, cell A, tissue A, it's all aging together. Aging in, in cell type A causes aging in tissue type A. Pretty simple. So the reverse is having the same equation. If a cell is reverse aging, then the entire tissue should reverse aging. Well, actually, that's what, it, we, first that was tested 15 years ago this year. Um, and what you found is that if you, if you reverse aging in skin that you grow in the laboratory or in endothelial cells lining an artery or in bone and joints, if you reverse the aging in those, you find that the tissue you grow now looks younger too. So example, 15 years ago, one of the things that was done was to take young cells and grow young skin on a rat. And if you do that, it looks like young skin. If you take old human skin cells and grow them on a rat, you get what looks like old skin. Now, in young skin, the, the dermis and the epidermis interlink. They interdigitate. Very hard to pull apart. Very tough and thick. In old skin, what you find is the skin is thinner and it doesn't interdigitate. It slides, which is why sometimes older people, if they get an, get an abrasion, the skin will just slough right off. It doesn't hold well. Now, if you take those same old skin cells and you reset telomeres and gene expression, and you grow them on a rat again, you get young skin. So we know that we can reverse aging in cells and grow young tissue. The question is what happens when we do it in humans? And that's really where we are now. It's where we should have been 15 years ago, but we're finally getting there. While promoting the intention of making this interview, some of my Facebook friends asked me to present to you the next question. Shrinkening the brain as age-related causing dementia on older people can be also stopped or reversed. Well, whether we can do it in people or not, we don't know yet, and we'd like to test it, but we know that that'll work in mice. So, example, if I take mice and I look at older mice, you find that the brain has shrunken. And typically, for example, some of these studies, you'll have 75% of normal volume, sort of like what happens with Alzheimer's brains. Um, now, if I reset telomere links in those brains, what you find is that you get back to about 90% of the volume that you had. So we know that we can get an improvement, and we don't know how far that can go. But we know it's not simply a matter of you've lost it forever, it can't be gotten back. To the contrary, it appears to be not only regrown if we look at the brain volume, but in terms of behavior. So the mice that before were having a hard time running across tight ropes, for example, are now much more able to do that than they were before. So we know we can improve both the, the brain in a, in a tissue sense and the brain in a behavioral sense by using telomerase. And what we'd like to do is try that in humans. This is very good news. Please talk about cancer. And after all these explanations, can you 100% say that telomerase does not cause cancer? because here we have a paradox and I don't understand it quite well. It's complex because as I've mentioned before, it's not that telomerase causes cancer or prevents cancer. It, it depends on the circumstance. Telomerase lowers the risk of having gene damage that causes cancer. But on the other hand, it can permit some cancer cells to continue to divide once they have that kind of damage. So it, it's not so easy. Let me explain some of this. If I look at, here's a typical chromosome, and right here I get hit by a cosmic ray, and I go from base thymidine to base guanine, uh, or, you know, it, I have an, a, a mutation there. I've got the wrong base, so I've got a mutation, all right? Now, normally what happens is there are four basic processes. My body comes along, recognizes an abnormality, it cuts out the abnormality, it puts in another correct base, and then it sort of connects things, it anneals them. So there are these four basic processes. And as cells senesce, as the telomeres shorten, all four of those processes slow down their rate of turnover so that the repair still occurs, but it's much, much slower. But that means that all, if all four processes are slower, they're multiplicative. They each depend on each other. So if each one were, for example, to be half as fast, that would be one half times one half times one half times one half. So you're looking at, you know, one sixteenth as fast. 
it's it's a it's an exponential increase. If I look at at cancer rates in, for example, human beings and mice, in both cases you find that they go up exponentially with age. So in human beings, you've got a certain cancer rate when you're young, it begins to climb, begins to climb, begins to climb. And it does that over, say, a 100-year period or a 70-year period, however kind of window you want to look at it over the human lifespan. But exactly the same thing is going on in mice. Their increase goes up exponentially in only a two-year period. What that tells you is it's not simply that cancer rate goes up because of exposure, exposure to time, the number of years you live. It's something to do with the way the cells repair it. In both cases, the repair rate is slowing down. In both cases, it goes up exponentially. For you and I, it may take 70 or 80 years. A model it may take two years. But in both cases, it's exponential. And in both cases, that's controlled by telomere shortening. That is the change in gene expression. So if we reset that, what happens? Do we reset your rate of repair? Do we make it less likely you can get gene damage? And the answer is yes. In the lab, that's exactly what happens. And we try these in some informal human studies. We don't see any increase in cancer rates either, but the informal human studies are relatively small, and it's not clear what we're really testing. So, so far, though, the, the data suggests that in most cases, if we reset telomere lengths, we lower the risk of cancer. But as I've said before, the other problem is what happens if the, if the cell is already mutated? You already have some damage. And now the question is, can the cell still divide? And if it doesn't have telomerase, the, the telomere will continue to shorten and the cancer cell will stop dividing. It's sort of a self-limiting problem. And if it can make just enough telomerase to continue to divide, it may go on to be a clinical cancer. If we raise the telomerase up high enough, we may in fact do what we know we can do in lab studies, which is reset repair. And so we may be able to repair some of the mutation problems in the first place that resulted in cancer. So the question you've asked, does telomerase cause cancer 100% prevent? Not easy to answer. So far, it looks like for most people, the, it would be protective, but it's early still. It probably is a good thing, not a bad thing to have telomerase, but it's complex. Uh, let, me answer it. let me answer that question a different way. Let's look at the kind of disease that you're treating. Let's say that I had telomerase and I could use it to treat your wrinkles, but let's say, and this is not true, I'm just making an example, let's say that one in a thousand times it caused a cancer. Would you want to use it to treat wrinkles? No, I'd rather stick with my wrinkles. I don't want that risk of cancer. But on the other hand, let's say that, I, that you know you have early Alzheimer's disease and that I can apparently cure it with telomerase, but that one in a thousand patients gets a cancer, then it's worth it because Alzheimer's disease is uniformly fatal. People who get Alzheimer's, the only reason that they don't die of Alzheimer's is just they die of something else first. It's 100% fatal. And there's no treatment for it, really. But if I have a treatment for it with some small risk of cancer, yes, I'd take it. So it depends. I don't know exactly what the risk is of using telomerase in terms of cancer, but it also depends not only what the risk is, but what I'd be treating. Wrinkles, I don't want to take a risk. Alzheimer's, in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Yes. And speaking about Alzheimer, which is the most terrifying disease of aging, please tell us more and what happens when Alzheimer is associated with other multiple pathology like atherosclerosis. Well, People used to think that Alzheimer's disease was simply a matter of an accumulation of beta amyloid. And then they thought it was beta amyloid and or tau tangles. And it got more complex. Nowadays, even the simple model realizes that there are a number of diseases on a spectrum. And one of those would be something like microvascular dementia and Alzheimer's. And there's some overlap. That is, people with frank normal Alzheimer's have some vessel disease. People with microvascular dementia apparently have some beta amyloid. You know, it's a gray zone. It's not simply black or white. There's, a, there's an overlap in the disease. The same thing, by the way, is probably true with things like Parkinson's disease. There is a tendency to think of Alzheimer's as causing cognitive dysfunction and no motor dysfunction, and Parkinson's disease is causing motor dysfunction but no cognitive dysfunction. Neither of those is true. We know that some Parkinson, a lot of Parkinson's patients have some cognitive disability. Some Alzheimer's patients have some motor problems. And now we're beginning to suspect that these diseases are related at a higher level. In one case, you have alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's. In another case, you may have beta amyloid and tau tangles. But upstream from those, in both cases, it's related to the cell's ability to turn over those compounds. 
that is cell senescence in the microglia and the astrocytes. So in all these cases, whether we're looking at vascular dementias, where we're looking at endothelial cell aging, or Parkinson's disease, where we're looking at changes in the, in the, in the globus pallidus and the substantia nigra, or we're looking at Alzheimer's, where we're looking at changes in the neurons, for example, in the frontal lobes, all of these diseases are probably related in terms of what's going on with cell senescence, in this case, with glial cells in the brain. One problem that people have had is that they all tend to think that since, uh, since cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's show dysfunctioning neurons, it's a neuronal problem. But only about 10% of the cells in your brain are neurons. The rest of them are glial cells. And a lot of these glial cells are dividing all the time, like microglia, astrocytes. They respond to toxins, for example, infections, for example, and just normal maintenance. These are the cells that appear to be responsible for the cascade of pathology that we identify as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's not simply beta amyloid. It's not simply alpha synuclein in Parkinson's. Um, the analogy I use sometimes is uh, an infectious disease. Last year, I was teaching a course on Ebola. And I could look at Ebola and say, well, a lot of patients get a fever and a high white count. So what if I were to remove some white cells and give them something to lower their, lower their fever? Would that cure it? Clearly not. Clearly, that's, that's naive. All I'd be doing is continuing to have my patients die of Ebola and treating symptoms. But that's exactly what we're doing with Alzheimer's. We're treating beta amyloid. We're trying to treat tall tangles. And these are downstream effects. They're not causes. They're downstream effects, like fever and white count in an infection. They're not the cause of the disease. The cause is upstream. And that's the reason why uniformly, for example, Every treatment we've looked at that's used, for example, monoclonal antibodies to treat beta amyloid has been ineffective. Even in the, the most arguable case, uh, a, a drug called solanezumab, the results were released in July this year. Um, what you find is that even statistically arguing, you know, the, the average Alzheimer's patient takes about eight years, mean lifespan about eight years from diagnosis to death, on the average. And if I look at patients that are treated with solanezumab, at best, statistically, I might have delayed the process by about three months. Not very impressive. And yet, they all die. So again, this would be like me saying, uh, you've got Ebola, and I may be able to delay your death by three or four hours. Thanks. That's not a cure. I think we need to go in at a more effective level, whether we're treating Ebola or whether it's treating Alzheimer's. We're not treating somebody by delaying it for a short while by treating a symptom. We should be treating the upstream causes of it, in this case, cell senescence and see if we can cure Alzheimer's disease. Chapter 7. Perhaps we will reverse aging tomorrow, but what can we do today? Well, uh, some things, but not much. Um, sometimes people say to me, what can you do to, to you know, slow the aging process? And uh, one, I sometimes say all of the answers are pretty obvious and people don't do them. You know, as a physician, I may recommend that patients do something. Your grandmother may give you advice. Most patients pay no attention to the advice either way. And the advice in general is not very sexy. It's things like a, a good diet, exercise, low stress, um, fastening your seatbelt even uh, will extend your lifespan. Um, but none of those things are very intriguing to people. If you're looking at uh, more advanced thoughts, I'd look at things like telomerase activators, uh, like biological approaches, large molecule approaches that are just beginning to come onto the, the, the landscape in a pharmaceutical sense. We're just beginning to go after these things. Um, but for most of us, those things aren't available. So here's an example. There are, there's at least one group of, of compounds available on the market that are telomerase activators. And these are called astrologicides. Uh, and probably the key molecule is called cycloestradiol, and it appears to, in many cases, help reset telomere lengths in gene expression. And there are at least two academic papers out that suggest that this may have an effect. But one, does it really help? Is it just a matter of resetting your blood pressure a little bit, or does it actually lower your risk of heart disease? We don't know. Two, what about the expense of it? You know, typically, you're looking at a couple of hundred dollars a month. Is that worth it? Well, I don't know. How much money have you got, and how much do you believe the articles? Um, three, it's hard to actually be sure what you're getting sometimes. I can go out on the Internet right now and order psychoestradiol or astralicoside compounds, but are, am I getting what I think I'm getting, or am I just giving money to some scam? It's very hard. 
for most of us to be sure what we're getting. So these are not easy questions. When you ask what can you do, there are a certain number of things we all have known for years you can do. Not very dramatic, not sexy, but still effective. Good diet, exercise, and so forth. And then there are the more advanced things. And it's not easy to do right now because it's hard to be sure who's got what and whether they really work and whether it's worth the money that you're spending on it. Not easy. Yes, that is true. Page 183. What about the value of meditation? Well, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I've been meditating probably for more than 40 or 50 years, I guess, really, and I've spent some time touring monasteries in, in Japan, the U.S., and the U.K., and elsewhere. Um, and I don't know. You know, I have a belief that meditation helps me with stress. Could be placebo, could be superstition. I'm perfectly happy with it. Don't get me wrong. Part of the problem I see is that the studies that look at meditation tend to be not well done. I still believe in the value of meditation, by the way. But uh, it's like I believe in the value of exercise and good diet. But a lot of the studies that are done are poorly done. Here's an example. There was a study done about two, three years ago that looked at what happens when I put people on a vegetarian diet, teach them to meditate, and I measure their telomere lengths in their bloodstream now and in six months and see what happens. And what you find is the telomere lengths go up. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. One is telomere lengths, so what? Do the people get healthier? How do you know? Did you lower their incidence of disease? Wasn't really looked at. The other problem is the telomere lengths in the bloodstream don't really tell you what you want to know. What you really want to know is what happens to the ones in my brain or in my heart. Those aren't the ones you're measuring. Plus, the, the telomere lengths in my white blood cells are dynamic. They're being changed all the time. New cells are coming in from the marrow. Some of the cells get involved in infection and die. Some of them go back into the, into the tissue. So that the population of white cells I'm looking at is changing all the time. If I'm measuring telomere lengths just in your bloodstream and I see the length go up, it doesn't prove that the cells got younger. I'm measuring a different population. i give you an example. Let's say that there is a block in Cluj that uh, changed dramatically. Fifty years ago, it had a number of old people in it. They were World War II veterans. Um, they were poor. Now, in that same neighborhood, that one block in Cluj, things have changed. Young people have moved in. They're having children. They're starting new little companies. There's some entrepreneurs. Fifty years ago, maybe the average age was 72, and now the average age is 32. That doesn't mean I made people younger. It means the people have changed on the block. But that's what's happening in your bloodstream. If I measure your, your peripheral white blood cells now and in six months, if the length goes up, it doesn't prove the cells got younger. The people have changed. They've moved. The block has turned over. It's got a different neighborhood. That's what's happening in your bloodstream, too. So when I see studies, for example, looking at meditation and saying meditation can make you younger, maybe, but that's not what the study showed. But if you would analyze this, if you would analyze the blood from a person, can you have the means to tell with specific analysis if his telomeres and mitochondria are in the range of certain age limits? or they correspond to another age limit, different than the one you're showing. Like, for example, if I'm 52 years old, and if in your analysis the results of the length of the telomeres and the mitochondrial genome shows that I am not in the range, is it possible? Well, you can do it, but I'd be careful about what, the impl what you think the implications are. Um, so here, here, let me give you an example. Let's say that right now I'm very stressed. Let's say I've got an infection and I've got a hard job and I have a divorce going on um, and I'm not sleeping. Um, the, the telomeres in my white blood cells will tend to be relatively short because they're being turned over rapidly. They're involved in infections. And the ones that are out there have, in a sense, been through the wars. Now, um, the divorce is gone. I've got a great job. I, I'm meditating every day. Uh, I'm relaxed, the infection's gone. The white cells that are circulating in my bloodstream now are no longer being turned over rapidly, so that they're essentially new from the marrow. They've come out from the marrow, and they haven't had time to divide rapidly in response to stress, so that they look younger. So I'm actually healthier, and my telomeres are longer. But the fact that they're longer doesn't mean that I'm younger. It means I'm no longer as stressed as I was before, so I'm not turning over my white cells. So if I measure your white cells one time and I try to infer that that means your body is 50 or 40 or 100 on the basis of white cells, that's misleading. 
if I measure them and measure them and measure them, and I, I find that all of your white cells over a period of a year seem to show that they act like you're a 40 year old, that's interesting. It's probably accurate. But just a one time measure, no, it could be that, uh, you know, you were suddenly stressed. Yeah, you have a viral infection, you get pneumonia. But is it possible to conduct a study for a one year period? Yes, you could do that. You know, we could measure your telomeres once a month for a year and see, you know, on the average, are they just about representing a 50 year old or do they show a decline or an increase? But it's hard to infer from that the rest of your body's age. So, you know, most people in your audience right now, the majority of people in your audience will end up dying of vascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, and so forth. Um, and after that, there's a, a risk of cancer and a risk of Alzheimer's disease and some other things. But most people die of vascular disease. If I really wanted to know your, uh, your body's age in terms of what's likely to kill you, the best thing I would look at would be the, the telomere links that line your arteries. But that would mean I have to put a catheter in remove a section of your coronary artery and take it to the laboratory and measure telomeres. Most people are not willing to do that. They'll donate a sample of blood, but not put a catheter in my heart. I don't blame them. Yeah, I, I would do it, yes, if there is a serious study. I'm interested <laughs> in science. I'm curious. It's I, I understand. I, well, I let me do it. Let me take it even further then. Let's say that you have a family risk of Alzheimer's disease and you're terrified you're going to get Alzheimer's disease and you really wanted to know, I would suggest that one of the best measurements would be the telomere links in your microglia in your brain. Do you want to do a brain biopsy for me to pull out a small sample? Of course, even if I told you the answer to that, we couldn't do anything about it unless I have a telomerase activator. So right now, it's information that's better than knowing your beta amyloid levels probably, but Still, that's a lot of risk. Most people aren't willing to do that. We can right now do scans that look at, for example, uh, beta amyloid in the brain, and that's correlated with your risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. We can probably get a much better correlation if I did a brain biopsy and measured telomere lengths, but I'd rather cure it than just measure it. Page 195. What diseases will we cure? Well, I think we'll cure a lot of diseases that people are sure we can't cure or have given up on. And that, that's the host of the whole panoply of age-related diseases. And by that, I mean Alzheimer's and vascular disease. I mean osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, skin aging, immune aging, and onward. Um, the big ones for me still are Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease. That is vascular disease, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, because those are the big killers. Yes, I think we can, we can, one, prevent them, and two, we can largely cure them. Now, let me put a caveat on that. One is, one of the issues that came up again and again in this discussion has been cancer. We don't know what the risk is. We have good reason to think the risk is a lot lower than we used to fear that it was, but we don't know precisely what it is yet. Um, two, there are bound to be some things that I call Humpty Dumpty phenomenon. You know, Humpty Dumpty uh, fell off the wall, the eggshell broke, the, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. If you've got a broken egg, you can't fix it. I, I, I would suggest, here's an example with regard to cardiovascular disease. Let's say that right now I can cure your cardiovascular disease by using a telomerase compound, and let's say that next year you were going to have a heart attack, but I prevented it, all right? Now let's say that last year you had a heart attack and you've got 50% of your myocardium gone. Can I then totally get back what you lost? The answer is probably not. There are some things we can't fix. Uh, the most extreme example would be if, you're, if your knee was bad and you replaced it with an artificial knee, I can't very well give you a new knee surface with chondrocytes because you don't have any chondrocytes anymore. But the same thing is probably true of heart disease. There's some things we can't get back, although the data suggests that you can regrow some heart muscle, which would surprise me, but that's what we're seeing in mice. The same thing in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think we can prevent it. To what extent can we actually cure it? And the answer is, uh, depends. I'm not sure we can, uh, I'm pretty sure we can't cure it all. So if I've got some patient who's in a nursing home, they've got advanced Alzheimer's disease, they can't tie their shoes, they can't feed themselves, they can't recognize people, can we improve that? I think we probably can, but not to the point where they're normal again, but I don't know that. 
I'm pretty sure we can take somebody with mild or moderate Alzheimer's disease and probably put them back into the category of totally normal. I don't know that either. But yeah, we can probably essentially cure most things, prevent almost all of these things, but we can't probably cure everything. There are probably limits. There usually are. Let's imagine that we already have the therapy. What will telomerase therapy be like? And will us be able to afford it? Two good questions. Uh, first, what will it look like? It, it will probably be this. Christian, you'll come into the office. We'll start an IV on you. We will give you a compound that has, some, uh, has the telomerase gene in it loaded into a, a, a vector. And uh, when we're done with that in maybe half an hour, uh, we'll measure some things on you, say goodbye, and that will be the end of the treatment. We may check on you in a few weeks. You may be able to, you may need to come back in 10 years or five years, but that will be the end of the treatment, all right? Uh, we've talked about it as a possibility that you'll get two or three treatments, but one treatment may do the trick. And again, every 10 years you may need it again, but you won't get it every day. Uh, it may be that because of the way we can deliver this, it may be as simple as a nasal inhalation. You may not actually need an IV, but initially we're thinking of it as an IV therapy. Uh, now, it, how much will it cost? Um, less than you might think, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, certainly it's expensive to put this together. If I were trying to put this therapy together for just one person, it would probably cost minimum of a couple of hundred thousand dollars. But that's because we're trying to gear it up and get it set once you've got it going, it's easy to make more of this stuff, and it also depends on how many people you're treating. So, example, say I've got an orphan disease like progeria. Again, that's the disease where five-year-olds look like they're 75 years old. Uh, at any given year, I used to know about four dozen of these children from all around the world. So, for, let's say there were 50 of them. Let's say that it cost me $50 million to make a drug to treat that. That means it's a million dollars per child to treat it. Very expensive. But with Alzheimer's disease, we're not looking at that. We're looking at millions and millions of people around the world. So as an example, let's say that there were only 50 million people with Alzheimer's disease in the world. There are many more than that. And it costs 50 million to make it. That's only a dollar a person. Pretty cheap. As it turns out, in the long run, most of the cost of, of a drug like this is not the production or the, even the research of it. A lot of the day-to-day -day costs are going to be the distribution and the administration. So if I have a drug that only costs a dollar and I go to my doctor or go to the hospital, it'll cost them a lot more than that to, to put down the records, to interview me, to measure my blood pressure, to give me the drug, to get the IV, to get the needles. There are a lot of other associated costs, as well as the transportation from wherever it's created to my clinic. So a lot of those costs are going to remain. But my best guess is that we're looking at a cost of this where a one-time one dose, maybe once every year, might run $1,000, not $100,000, but maybe $1,000. You're looking at a cost that over a 10-year period is not that much, particularly if what it means is you don't get Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. It also, note, lowers the cost of health care in general. That is, a lot of the cost of Alzheimer's disease paid for in any country is nursing home care, support for these patients, all those costs are now gone. So you've wiped out billions of dollars of healthcare costs globally and substituted something that's much cheaper and much more effective. An analogy, uh, can you hear me? Yes. An analogy here might be the, in polio. In 1950, a lot of children were put on uh, iron lungs and were in nursing homes and had a lot of re rehabilitation care. And there was concern in the early 1950s that that expense would go up over time and that we'd have a terrible health care cost because of children with polio. We don't. What we have now is a polio vaccine that literally costs pennies and it costs more to distribute than it does to create. All of those expensive costs associated with polio are now gone. I think that's what we're looking at with Alzheimer's. We're going to have a therapy that is relatively cost effective and totally wipes out a lot of costs that people are reasonably concerned about right now in terms of global health care costs, nursing home care, support for these patients, and so forth. They'll be gone. Last question. Do you believe that in the next decades, those still living would have the chance of reverse aging and live up until 150, 200 years old? 
Yes, I do. Um, and, and I say that obviously with some trepidation because right away people think you're crazy when you say that. And it's true that my major concern is not extending the lifespan, it's extending the healthy lifespan. That is, I'm not trying to make people live to be 150 and have Alzheimer's. I'd be happy if they lived to be 80 and never had Alzheimer's. I want people not to get disease. Um, but it's true that in order to be able to cure Alzheimer's disease or cure cardiovascular disease, I'm going to have to change the underlying process of aging at the cellular level. And the outcome of that, sort of as a side effect, is that, yes, you're likely to live a much healthier and much longer life without these diseases because we've altered the way you age. So, yes, the outcome is likely to be that the average lifespan may double, for example. Now, not that that not only has the impact on population, of expanding the population, but more importantly, it's expanded the population of people who are healthy and capable of working. One of the big concerns right now globally, Japan comes to mind, Italy comes to mind, most countries have this concern, is that the, you know, we have a certain number of children who are supported, a certain number of older people who are supported, and in between there we have a working age population, and that the proportion of working age population is shrinking in comparison with the older people and younger people, but the older people that are now retired and not working, they may have Alzheimer's, they may be you know, handicapped in other ways from their health. Well, what we're doing is expanding that population of healthy people by narrowing the people who are retired, sick, Alzheimer's, handicapped, and making those healthy people. So the impact economically is likely to be all to the good. And again, totally at variance with the usual uh, linear predictions on the basis of demography. People look at the demographics globally and think we're going to be in trouble because we're going to have so many retired people and not enough people working and putting in money to retirement and, and paying for taxes. No, to the contrary. We're going to find that we've got a lot of people who are perfectly healthy, capable of working, and probably want to. This is really amazing. This could be a shock to our viewers because it's a topic never presented before in Romania. What will happen to our culture and our lives when we will become able to reverse aging? That's a good question. I sometimes say that if you ask yourself whether this is good or bad, whatever that means, for you personally, this is good. You, you take away your fear of Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, your aches. You know, people, people, a lot of people will say that they don't mind aging, but when they realize that aging means aching joints in the morning and uh, broken hips when you fall on the floor, that they mind. So you take these away. You take away disease. So from the personal perspective, I think this is all to the good. From the societal perspective, the cultural perspective, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. There's that, that old apocryphal Chinese saying, uh, may you live in interesting times. Well, this makes times interesting. You're undercutting a lot of our cultural assumptions. We all assume that Somewhere around age 20, we'll start having a job and be productive, start having children, a family, and somewhere around age 65, we may retire and we may be sick and we're going to die. Well, what if those assumptions now change? And the assumption is instead, apparently, you're going to live to be 120 or 150, and that while you may get sick, it's still going to be a very short period of your life. In fact, a shorter percentage than you used to have. That changes everything. It changes the way we look at our lives. It changes our pessimism and our optimism. It changes our realism about what life is about. But it also changes things like families. It changes the way we deal with the economy. It changes our politics. It changes everything. Everything gets undercut. Here's a, here's a trivial example, maybe. Um, it's pretty clear that this would cut the cost of life insurance. i uh, paying a premium over a period, and then maybe 50 years later I die. But if I live a much longer period, the life insurance premium will go down. All right, we can predict that. But we can only predict that if we know how long you live, and we don't know how long people will live. We do now. We know averages. But what if we change that? We have a hard time setting a premium. We know it should go down, but we don't know how far down it goes because we don't know what the lifespan is until we get there. That's even worse if you're talking about things like disability. Right now, if I uh, get on a motorcycle and I fall off and I break my neck and I'm a quadriplegic, you can estimate how long somebody will live and there's an expense in caring for them. But what if their lifespan is increased, but I can't really fix their quadriplegia? What does that do to the cost of, of disability insurance? I don't know. In short, our assumptions are hard to, they've shifted. Uh, another example might be retirement. 
Right now, if I'm a government and I'm trying to estimate how much it will cost to pay retirement benefits, I know roughly how long people will live. And I could calculate that and adjust my Social Security, for example, so that the taxes correspond to what I need to pay out. Very difficult politically. Economically, really easy to calculate. But if I extend the human lifespan, now it's economically hard to calculate because I don't know how long you'll live, how long it'll be till you get sick again. So it becomes, all of these things become enormously complex. And yet they're hopeful signs too. Uh, one example would be what happens in industry. Um, you know, we know right now you may have an average working lifespan of, say, 45 years. Well, what if I double that? What that means is it took a certain number of years for you to learn your skill. And then at the end, you retire, you die. We bury people with never mind educations, but experience. We bury expertise every day. They're gone. But instead of that, now we have people who have expertise, they have knowledge, they have perspective, they have wisdom, if you want, and they're still there. That means that the cost of training goes down. You know, an average tool and die maker takes about 15 years to, to break even for a company that's making, making manufacturing products. It may take them 15 years to pay off the cost of training somebody to be a tool and die maker. And so that means they've got 15 years of training, 30 more years productive, so one to two ratio. But what if I make it one to five ratio? I've lowered the cost of the economy. Suddenly the economy becomes more efficient. Only one minute remain, and if you agree, we can meet next year and record a new interview. We'll do it. Let me know when, Christian. My pleasure. Dear Professor Michael Fossil, it was a pleasure to have you as guest for my TV program, and I have not enough words to describe my feelings and emotions. Your amazing information is life-changing for everybody. And I can recommend your book to a publisher and hope to have the means of translating into Romanian language. It's a life-changing book. I thank you a lot. Well, thank you. And we're moving ahead with a, uh, a biotech company, Telesite, to see if we can take this to human trials and cure Alzheimer's. So follow Telesite.com if you're interested. And after broadcasting, the two-part interview miniseries will be also posted on my YouTube channel, and all English-spoken viewers will be able to watch it permanently. And you may share the links in your web pages and with friends. Thank you very much for having this amazing opportunity. And thank you for being able to share things with friends like you. Thanks, Christian. Mulțumesc. Mulțumesc și eu foarte mult. Știința face progrese uibitoare și cred că a sosit momentul să-i acordăm atenție din ce în ce mai mult. Nu doar ca fapt divers al unor noutăți ce vă sunt prezentate într-o emisiune de știință, ci pentru că aceste informații ar putea avea un rol tot mai important în ceea ce privește ridicarea nivelului de calitate a vieții pe baza cunoașterii. Parafrazându-l pe Bruce Lipton, cunoaștere înseamnă putere, dar în lipsa acestor cunoștințe, chiar dacă aveți un potențial imens, el nu se va transforma într-o realitate dinamică care să vă ajute efectiv în viață. Referitor la acel studiu legat de analiza telomerilor pornind de la o biopsie din artera mea carotidă, cred că până la urmă nu îmi surâd de ideea de a participa. Poate se vor inventa alte metode. Rămâne de văzut ce ne mai rezervă viitorul medicinei regenerative. Cu siguranță vom asista la surprize uimitoare. Cred că știința are deja la îndemână instrumentele teoretice și practice pentru a ne ajuta să eradicăm majoritatea maladiilor degenerative și a celor legate de îmbătrânire. Dar aceste terapii nu își vor putea dovedi eficiența fără o modificare profundă a stilului de viață pentru a atinge acel grad de civilizare despre care amintea profesorul Fossel, în care războaiele și bolile să devină doar o amintire a trecutului. Vestea bună este aceea că profesorul Michael Fossel a acceptat să înregistrăm noi interviuri în fiecare an și în plus se preconizează traducerea și editarea cărții sale în limba română. Oare vom apuca să fim martorii apariției unei societăți umane în care majoritatea indivizilor vom trăi 150 sau chiar 200 de ani? Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.